Hello, everybody. Welcome to another online message from First Christian Church in Hermiston, Oregon. We are presently and sadly for the second time under a stay at home order. That means we are continuing to navigate our way through this time of pandemic and trying to figure out constantly how we can do church during this time. And we continue to pray daily for those whose lives have been impacted by this virus, both inside and outside of our congregation. But right now, I'd like you to just focus on being in the Word of God with me and asking God to open up your heart to His Word uh, and to understand, uh, you know, here's the world pressing in around us, and here's the Word of God penetrating into the world and penetrating into our lives and helping us. So it's, it's important that we just ask God to help us. I'm calling this message, Tough Love Revisited. And if you don't have your Bible handy, go grab it, push pause, do that pause thing, and come back with your Bible, and, and we'll be ready to look at this together. A few weeks ago, I went on a painting trip and I drove five hours uh, to an extremely remote place along the Idaho-Oregon border. A beautiful place to paint. I love it down there. And then driving down for five hours and then driving back for five hours gave me lots of time to keep hitting search on the radio and listen to a lot of other preachers. And I actually listened to quite a few. And as I did, this question started to kind of form in my mind. And the question was this. If I were not a Christian, and I was listening to several or any one of these messages, what would I think Christianity is all about? Because it was coming across to me that every message I was hearing Every radio program I listened to that was a Christian radio program seemed to be playing the same tune. They were, they were all kind of hitting the same note. And the note they were hitting was this. Here is what the scripture says. Are you doing it? And it even came across, are you doing it sufficiently, accurately? And if I were a non-Christian, I would have thought that the topics I was hearing, I would have thought that not gossiping, not using profanity, not lying, not cheating on my spouse, not berating my children, not using money according to a certain kind of plan or pattern, I would have thought that Christianity is all about either not doing those things wrongly or doing all these things correctly. And that's Christianity. And then I would have thought to myself, why would I ever need to be a Christian if that's what it's all about? I can strive for that kind of a life without being a member of a church. Why would I ever go to church? I bring this up as a way for us to enter into chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, and even as a way for us to kind of mold our thinking as we go through the next few chapters of 1 Corinthians. For me, it's a struggle. How do I get people to see that Christianity is not simply about values and morals? That it's not simply about doing certain things right. It involves that, but it is so much more than that. And what I'm talking about is far more than simply my interpretation of Scripture over against your interpretation of Scripture or anybody else's interpretation of Scripture. As I look at it, the world right now feels like it is done 
with judgmental Christianity and doesn't need to hear any more about it. That's what I take away from what I hear in the world. Now, I want you to turn to this chapter, chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, and I want you to look at the very last sentence in this chapter. My translation says, drive out the wicked person from your company. Purge, yours might say, this wicked person from your assembly, your church, your company. I cannot ask the non-Christian to understand this. It's not right. I cannot ask the non-Christian to understand this. This is the very thing Paul is talking about in chapter 2 when he says we interpret spiritual things to spiritual people. And someone living at the merely flesh or human level doesn't accept the things of God's Spirit. This is exactly what he's talking about. That's why that's in the first chapter and second chapter. And then we get to these things in the fifth chapter. What I can do with a non-Christian is ask them to listen to the reason Paul says what he says in chapter 5. Now, there are basically four paragraphs in this chapter, and I want to take each one of them and just unpack each one as we go. So that's kind of how this message is going to flow. So let's just read chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, first paragraph. Paul says, everybody's talking about the sex scandal that's going on in your community, not least because it's a kind of immorality that even the pagans don't practice. Well, I never. A man taking his father's wife. And you're puffed up. Why aren't you in mourning? Why aren't you getting rid of the person who has done such a thing? I have met a lot of people who would probably want to begin the letter at this point, that this is the big problem they see and they would jump right into it. Isn't it interesting that that's not where Paul begins the letter? This is chapter five. As you remember, he begins with a much bigger problem and it's the problem of disunity in the church. Squabbling, and quarreling, taking sides, and saying one leader is better than another, one way of thinking is better than another way of thinking, I like this person, I don't like that person. And the Apostle Paul treats this disunity as the biggest problem of the church. Then he moves on into all the other problems that have been reported to him. And here is the one that shocks him. Apparently, someone in the church has had or having some kind of a relationship, sexual relationship, with his probably stepmother. We just don't have enough information from Paul, because he already knows the people, of what kind of a wife of a husband is involved. Because there were different kinds of marriages in the Roman Empire, so uh, we don't know. But it's clear that everyone knows about it. Pagans don't do it. Non-Christians don't do it. And he says they don't do anything about it. And that is shocking to Paul. Notice that? Not even the non-Christians in Corinth would consider doing such a thing. But I want you to notice how fast, how quickly Paul gets into the real problem or what we might call the bigger problem here. He says, you are all puffed up about it. Being puffed up 
just means being arrogant. And arrogance means I don't need anyone telling me that I'm wrong. I don't need Paul telling me what to do. I don't need Apollos telling me what to do. I don't need anyone telling me that I'm doing it wrong. I don't need your help. I don't need your instructions. I don't need your opinions. That's arrogance. Perhaps the Corinthians, or at least some of them, are taking Paul's teaching that the old has passed away and the new has come, and with the new comes freedom in Christ, and perhaps they're taking that being acclimated by their culture about freedom and says, and they conclude, we can do whatever we want. We are free in Christ. We're even better than we were when we were non-Christians. We can kind of pick that up from what he is going to say to them in chapter 9 a little later on, where he says, well, yeah, everything is permissible for me. Everything is lawful for me. Everything. But not everything builds up. Not everything is helpful. They seem to have the freedom from sin and the freedom from guilt thing pretty well figured out. But they seem to be missing the connection that once you're free from something, that means you're free for something. That freedom isn't this state of you know, absolute license to do whatever you want. That freedom is always from something and for something. So at the end of the paragraph, the real difficulty begins. And the real difficulty is this. Why aren't you, church, getting rid of the person who's done such a thing? Apparently, Paul has a different idea of what a membership drive is all about. Let me say it again. The real issue isn't so much the sin. It is a huge, shocking thing. But the real issue Paul is going to struggle with and deal with is how the church is dealing with it. How do you show love and not compromise the truth? How do we maintain unity when we don't agree on everything? How can we be sure that, how can we be the dwelling place of God in the spirit if we set ourselves up in the place of God? Arrogance. How can the church be the dwelling place of God in the spirit if we set ourselves up as the final judge, as God? Now let's move on to the next paragraph. And it's just the verses three through five. He says, let me tell you what I've already done. I may be away from you physically, but I am present in the spirit. And I've already passed judgment as though I was there with you on the person who has behaved in this way. When you are assembled together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and my spirit is there too with the power of our Lord Jesus. You must hand over such a person to the Satan, to the devil, for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. Here, Paul is exercising his authority as an apostle of Jesus. And I want to I make something really clear here. We must never, ever overlook the importance of the apostle's authority. Paul's authority comes directly from Jesus. He always begins his letters by saying that. He is an apostle by the, call, by the will of God, called by Jesus Christ. Even in this letter, he begins, 
called by God's will to be an apostle of King Jesus. And Jesus gave the apostles the authority of the kingdom to bind and loose, to forgive and hold, not forgive. The apostles are a part of the very foundation of the church alongside of Jesus, who is the chief cornerstone. Never underestimate the importance of that. And just as God sent Jesus into the world by his own will, not by our request, so Jesus sent his apostles into the world by his own will and decision, not by our request. Paul came to Corinth when these people were completely ignorant of God and the gospel, and Paul founded the church there. And so he speaks to them with this apostle's authority. And he says, in that capacity, I have already passed judgment. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says, when they are assembled as the church. Well, what does that mean? Perhaps there were times when the whole church of Corinth, all the house churches, small groups, got together in some one central place and met together as the church. Or maybe it was as the church, as he'll say later in 1 Corinthians 11, they are the church specifically when they're taking the Lord's Supper. We don't know what he means. But he requires them at this time to turn this person over to the Satan, to the devil. Why? Very interesting. For the destruction of his flesh. Stay with me. Not for the destruction of him as a person. Now, why would any church ever do such a thing? Verse 5. So that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. It doesn't say so his soul will be saved. It's so important in this chapter and in the whole letter to see how Paul is contrasting flesh and spirit. We know that when we die, we will be raised with a new body. So our bodies are very much a part of God's creation and God's plan of salvation. And a our, our bodies are going to be a part of the new heaven and the new earth, but they are going to be a new body, a spiritual body. Still a body, but, but alive and raised, but spiritual. I Meaning it was completely infused and moved by the Spirit of God. Now we only have the Holy Spirit as a down payment of what we're going to receive in the future. So the contrast here is between the flesh, which is human and earthly and for this time only, and the spirit. It's a contrast between the old and the new. And when we were baptized into Christ, we put off the old and we put on the new. Now we live in the spirit and we are led by the spirit and we understand spiritual things. We have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. In the Bible, the world is under the power of the evil one, the devil, the Satan, the opposer. But Jesus has defeated the power of death and the devil and has opened up the door to new life and this new age to come, new heaven and earth. And this is all beginning now in Jesus, in the church. All of this is in Paul's mind when he says, turn him over to the Satan for the destruction of his flesh so his spirit can be saved. In other words, he's saying, it's not too late. More than likely, this is the man that Paul is writing about in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses about 6 through 11. And he says in those verses, you know, the 
the, uh, the man that you put out by the majority has suffered enough, bring him back and forgiving lest, lest he's, you know, let him know that you love him. You know, he's, he's obviously changed and repented, bring him home. You might want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and 11 in light of what we're talking about today. Let's move on to the next paragraph, verses 6, 7, and 8. He says, your boasting is, is no good. Don't you know that a little yeast or leaven works its way through the whole lump of dough? Cleanse out the old leaven so that you can be a new lump. The leaven-free lump you really are. It's Passover time, you see. And our Passover lamb, the Messiah, I mean, has already been sacrificed. What we now have to do is to keep the festival properly. None of the leaven of the old life and none of the leaven of depravity and wickedness either. What we need is leaven-free bread and that means sincerity and truth. Now, first of all, let me just point out, I even used the word and I didn't mean to. He's not talking about yeast. It's one of the things that N.T. Wright pointed out in these lectures, and I'm grateful for this correction and accuracy because I have often used the word yeast in, in the place of leaven because we're so familiar with the word yeast. But he pointed out, he said, it's not the same thing as leaven. My grandmother, Glasgow, made the best sourdough bread and pancakes in the whole world. And she had a jar of starter, sourdough starter, that she kept, I think, in the fridge, but I'm not sure where. And she used it to get that bread to rise. The starter was simply fermented sourdough dough. Can I say that twice? The starter was simply fermented sourdough dough. That's what leaven is. Fermented dough. And the important point of what Paul is saying is that it's not something that is different being added like yeast, which is a different product. But leaven is the same thing as the dough, only it has been turned rotten. And that little bit of rotten will permeate the whole loaf. The Passover image is perhaps the most powerful image of freedom in the history of the world. And it took time to ferment the dough. So when God said in Egypt, it is, when I say it's time to go, I don't want you waiting around for the stuff to ferment before you leave. Use unleavened bread and go quickly. You see, the original idea of Passover wasn't so much about sin as it was about freedom from slavery and death through the blood of the Lamb. Even the innocent babies were set free from slavery. They were re all were rescued from slavery and were led to the promised land. Just like we were baptized into, they were baptized into Moses and the Red Sea and were set free from their slavery. We are baptized into Jesus and we are set free from our slavery to sin and are being led to the promised land, the new heaven and the new earth. That is what leads Paul to say what he says in verse 7. Cleanse out the rotten so that you can be a new loaf, the leaven-free dough you really are. That's pretty cool. The leaven-free dough you really are. And I want to say this. Just like, I don't know, capital letters. He isn't talking about using unleavened bread in church. He is talking about living a leaven-free uh, life that God has called us to live, that we remove the rotten stuff from our past and the rotten stuff of the world and wickedness. We remove it from our lives. 
when we put off the old and we keep doing that and we live the holy life before God. That's what he's talking about. In Galatians, Paul develops this quite plainly. And in Galatians chapter 5, he describes what the life in the flesh is like. You know, the rotten leaven. And he describes after that what the life in the spirit is like. And again, contrast between flesh and spirit. We call it the fruit of the spirit and the works of the flesh. But when he gets to verse 24 in Galatians 5, he says, And those who belong to the Messiah, Jesus, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, he says, let's line up our lives with the Spirit. Exactly what he's saying here in 2 Corinthians. Now let's read the last paragraph, 9 through 13. He says, I wrote to you in the previous letter, that one we don't have, not to become associated with immoral people. And the word immoral in the Greek is porno, or we get our word pornography. It's all kinds of immorality. Verse 10, I didn't, of course, mean immoral people in the world at large, or greedy people, or thieves, or idolaters. I mean, to avoid them, you'd have to remove yourselves from the world altogether, and God doesn't want you to do that. You're here to help these people. I'm adding a little bit in there. Verse 11. No, I was referring to people who call themselves Christians, but who are immoral or greedy, idolaters, blasphemers, or drunkards, or robbers. You shouldn't associate with them hang out with them, and you shouldn't even eat a table with a person like that. Why should I worry about judging people outside? It's the people inside you should judge, isn't it? God judges the people outside. Drive out the wicked person from your company. I hope we all know this already, but it will be good to remind ourselves of one thing. Judging isn't condemning. It is not condoning. It is not condoning something. Parents exercise this kind of judgment all the time. Don't do that. That will hurt you. We don't condone that in our family. Don't use those words. We don't condone that in our family. That's judgment. I don't want you hanging out with that person because you're only going to get into trouble. I care about you and I love you. That's why I'm saying it. We don't condone that kind of behavior. You know, people like Dennis make judgments too, and we live with them. The dentist says, well, you have a wicked cavity in that tooth, and I'm going to need to get a really big power drill out and bore a big hole in that thing so we can make you feel better. And you do it because you trust his judgment or her judgment. You see, a world without any kind of judgment would just be a world in chaos and anarchy. Our world's struggling with that right now. But none of these judgments that Paul is talking about, none of them that I've described to you that happens within a family or happens with a doctor, they're not made out of hatred and rejection. They're made out of love. So I'm just saying maybe it's time we revisit that idea of tough love. But revisit it with the idea that how should this really work? You see, if the dentist says that he needs to drill a hole in my tooth, he said that and he made that judgment because I went to him first 
with my problem and I trust him to fix it. He has the knowledge and the skills to do it. A parent can say to their child, I don't want you hanging out with her or him. Why? Because I love you. I don't want you to ruin your life. The child is a part of that family and there's trust. The point that Paul is making, the point I want to make is that we cannot judge people who are not a part of the family of God. You cannot discipline someone if there's no relationship, if there's no faith and there's no trust. I cannot, as a parent, discipline those other kids. I cannot judge those other kids. I can only say to my children, I don't condone that. I don't want you to hang out with them. Only the ones who are inside the family can go through that kind of judgment. I'm not to judge those outside the church. I have nothing to say about their beliefs, their lifestyle choices, or other practices. But there will be judgment. God will be their judge. But I have nothing to say about it. Now, questions come up, though. What if we are in the church and we have a completely different understanding about one of these significant scriptures? All I can say is you have to be true to your understanding of the word where you are on your journey. And you're on a journey towards God. Everybody is. And I have to be true to my understanding of the word at my place in my journey towards God. And I am not to judge your faith, and I'm not to judge your understanding. And you are not to judge my faith or my understanding. But if we have the same Lord and we're committed to grow closer to him, I believe we will eventually grow closer together. It always comes back to the question of authority, doesn't it? I mean, this is where Paul begins the letter. Authority shows up all through the letter. And he will be in a battle about authority all the way through this letter and 2 Corinthians and all of his letters, because that's the big issue. Jesus' word is my final authority. But I want you to understand when I say that. If I say Jesus' word or the word of God is my final authority, I mean not my understanding of it, not my experience of it, Certainly not my feelings about it, but only Jesus, the word of God, is my final authority. How about you? Is Jesus the final authority in your life? What a great opportunity in this chaotic, crazy world to get on your knees, to open your heart up to God, and say, Jesus, I want you to be my final authority of my life. There's all kinds of things in Scripture I don't understand. But Jesus, I trust you. I come to you because I trust you. I believe there is a God. I believe you are his son. And I want to trust you. I want to be a part of your family. Please, please, let me be a part of your family and enjoy your presence. Fill me with your spirit. Allow me to be the person you want me to be and you planned for me to be. Make that your prayer. Make that your prayer today. Thank you. See you next week. God bless.